Hi, this is Kevin Raber, and I'm really excited to be with you today. We're going to talk about something very, very cool. Uh, I hope all of you will enjoy it. Um, my guest today will be Chiabella James, and we're going to be looking at her work as set photographer on the first movie, Dune. Chiabella, thank you for being Hello. with me. Hello. So, Pleasure. <laughs> Chiabella is from London and um, got a lot of energy and... Uh, she made this marvelous book um, called Dune, and uh, the links for this book will be uh, number one overview, and you know, right on the screen below, and will also be in the description uh, below. And it's an amazing book. It's very thick, and it's got just some amazing photographs in it. And um, you've got to really cherish and uh, sit down with this book. And I, I sat down with a glass of wine. Uh, eventually, it became two glasses of wine. <laughs> but it's really, really well done. Uh, each of the images, you, you can see there's kind of a glow to them or a sheen to them. The paper's a matte paper and the images kind of have a spot coating to them. And there's a lot of detail. And if you're familiar with the Dune series, uh, you'll understand how good, you know, this productions are, especially look at these low key type pictures and so forth. So you'll enjoy this book. There's uh, uh, several, I think there, I came out to be, uh, 280 some odd pages uh, and uh, there's a lot of photography so if you're like me and you like photography uh, you'll enjoy this book so let's talk to Chiabella about how this book started so first off tell me a little bit about your background how you got into uh, this kind of photography and uh, where where you live and what you do and so forth I'll, I'll okay. throw it over to you thank you sure um I the best way to describe it is I was born into it. Um, I am the offspring of a legendary unit stills photographer who set some very big shoes for me to fill. <laughs> so much so I tried really hard not to for a long time. Um, but a sequence of events led me back to it, um, as I suppose you could say it was meant to be. Um, <laughs> yeah. So... <laughs> So I, I stopped projecting it and finally embraced it. Um, so my my training, my upbringing are all one and the same. Um, David James was my my teacher, mentor, and parent. Um, so that's how I got into it. In terms of, of making a career of it, um, I really accidentally fell back into um, assisting David. Um, and assisting turned into apprenticing, apprenticing turned into realization that this is where I should be and what I should be doing. So we ended up becoming a sort of stills duo um, for several projects, which was incredible. I, I feel very lucky because it's the kind of job role that you don't, you don't really ever get a, a colleague or a teammate, let alone working as a duo with your father. So. I feel really fortunate that we got to do that for a few years. Um, and yeah, I suppose I've just been kind of riding the wave ever since then. Um, it, it's a, a freelance and very niche world to be in. So it's hard to make plans and have, have goals within it because you really just have to kind of ride the wave and, and move along with it, which is what I've been doing. Um, that said, when June came along, um, I, I landed in a, a world that I didn't realize still existed where photography in film could really be an art form. And that experience and that job alone kind of set me in, in motion towards the idea that we could show off unit stills as an art it's very much a niche and it has its set of skills but I don't think people really see it as its own art because you are in somebody else's world and you are photographing something that's been created for you um but that said a lot of the photography in the book is not necessarily what was on camera or from the angles that were on camera or lit for what was on camera um because the world they created was 360. So I felt more like a photographer set into this environment and got to be a photographer in a more natural sense. So um, the idea for the book came 
out of that experience and I, I think I, early days of seeing what we were producing both for the film and and in the photographs uh, you know I turn over select when when I'm on the job for the filmmakers to kind of give me feedback and it was in seeing those selects that I kind of started to feel like okay there's a collection here that I know will never see the light of day for marketing just because they're not those kind of images but I want them to see the light of day in some way shape or form so um after the movie was over and the success of the film um I pitched the idea of photography book as a kind of follow-up when they were doing more books um after the making of books so they took it they ran with it and uh fortunately some of these images actually get to see the light of day which is really uh, that that's the part that feels the best to have this book in hand it's it's so often that you photograph a movie and so many images don't get used not because they're not great but just because they don't fit the strategy or the campaign or any number of reasons um so this allowed us to to show off another 200 images that wouldn't otherwise have seen seen day so well they're they're number one they're very cool images because not only are you looking at shots that you recognize in the sense that you know they're they were part of the movie but you know you caught the behind scenes and the other things so i mean imagine being standing where a camera is and there's the scene you're photographing and filming in front of you but you know you've collected you know images of what it takes to work in the environment the, the crew walking across deserts or you know the setups that were done to you know make a shot like that and i don't think a lot of people really understand you know, they watch a movie or see a movie and don't realize that there's 30, 50 people sometimes standing yeah. behind yeah. what you're looking. So like if you could turn around in, the, in your movie seat and see what's behind you, you know, all that is there. And, you know, while that book is not all about what's behind the scenes, I think you give good reference to, you know, what it takes to see what's be in, in front of the camera as well as behind the camera. But um, it, I'm impressed because I expected you, you were going to show me in a book a whole bunch of people dangling from wires and green screens and different things <laughs> like that. But from what it looks like, this is a movie that was, you know, except for certain things, filmed in a set that wasn't generated after effects kind of thing. No, correct, correct. Um, which is so incredibly special for a photographer. Um, you know, when you have when you're photographing a film that's uh, mostly a CGI visual effects world, it's really hard, A, to imagine it, but also B, to capture it, you know, in a way that's accurate to, to the story um, because there's such a big chunk missing, whether it's blue screen or, you know, an object that's been replaced by a tennis ball. There's no way for me to, to properly tell the story other than behind the scenes and how we did it. Whereas with, June, I the layer, it felt more like there was just a layer that wasn't there as opposed to a whole world that was missing because I think they, they really filmed it from a way that was so practical. The sets were incredible. The, the deserts were incredible. So the layer that they added afterwards, even though it's missing from the imagery in the book, I don't think you necessarily feel it. You just feel like maybe I didn't photograph those parts those parts just weren't in the book, but they don't feel like they're missing completely. Um, and that's really special for a photographer on set, you know, to, to be able to, to properly tell the story in camera, in those images, without the visual effects is, is unusual and, and really special. You know, it, it makes for much better imagery. Well, I think, you know, you did a really good job. And when um, <laughs> I sat down a few nights ago with, a glass of wine intending to you know <laughs> obviously go through the book and make some notes or put stickies in them and so forth and then of course as uh, a, a a younger kevin i, I read the, the book uh, and all books and you know if you read a book i don't know if everybody is like me but you know it turns into a visual you know you you, you see the buildings you see the the ships you see the the dust you get the whole feeling in a, in a book that's why i enjoy reading so much but to see images that you've captured, and of course, the way the movie was made, 
it's like fulfilling the dream. I mean, everybody was like, oh, someday the, the book's too big to make a movie of. You know, it's just how do you make a movie yeah. of, of something so immense? It's kind of like the yeah. foundation series that's being done on Apple TV right now. I mean, that's another one of those kind of, you know, immense, you know, kind of stories. But uh, your your images and your captures are what I would be seeing in my dreams, which I think is so cool. <laughs> that's so nice to hear. I yeah, I mean that I that as I said like that's. I feel fortunate that that was the world that I got to photograph because it it does it does allow you so much more freedom. I and and you mentioned the behind the scenes as well. I really struggled. It, you know, it's one of those things where I I try not to overshoot because it's a job. It, I'm not just there for the fun of it. Like I have a job to fulfill, and I have certain things I need to capture in a certain way. So sometimes you you know you just have to focus on one area otherwise it's too much but on that set I, I 360 degrees I was always something to capture on camera off camera uh -huh. above and below there was just so much it was such a rich environment to to photograph um wow. so uh -huh. I I feel bad for the labs they got way too much <laughs> photography <laughs> what an opportunity though I mean that's a lifetime of an opportunity to yeah. you know have been involved in that um so I mean you've got to be that's pretty incredible now um I don't mean to switch gears quickly. Obviously, you know, we only have so much time to, to talk, but, you know, we are a photography site and um, there are photographers that pretty much will be the audience. Everybody is going to want to know, okay, what gear do you use? Let's talk about that first and how you match the the vision of the DP with the kind of photography that you, you were shooting. So, you know, go over a little bit about your uh, cameras that you used and the lenses you used and how you were able to you know select the lens to duplicate what was actually going on set controversial answer i am not a technical photographer um in the sense that i keep it as minimal as possible um two bodies one on each shoulder two lenses that give me the spectrum of as many different lenses as possible within one. So I'm on zooms. Um, the way that I shoot on set is by moments. I don't, I don't feel like I have the time, especially these days when it's digital and everything's going really fast on set. There isn't, there isn't time. And certainly as the stills photographer, there isn't the opportunity to go and change a lens if it doesn't feel right mid-take. No. That, just, that just doesn't exist. So I don't want to forego those moments because I've got the wrong lens on when we might not do a second take. This might be my only option. And if I can wiggle my way into some tiny spot on set, I don't want to be a distraction in the eye line if I'm running out and changing lenses and and trying to you know make those adjustments while we're while we're moving um so for me to become discreet and for me to capture those moments where i wouldn't otherwise be able to i have to have all of it on me at any one given moment so i keep i have a 24 to 70 on one shoulder and the 70 to 200 on the other um say again that gives you a very good range. It does. It, it gives me as, as broad of a spectrum as possible. Now, obviously, if there's a specific scene that we're shooting that I have to, you know, we're we're across the desert and I have to switch onto a 400 mil lens, then, then yes, sure. then I will. And, and those occasions do happen. But 90% of the time, I'm on those two bodies, those two lenses all day, every day. Um, and, and so for me, it's less about the technicalities and more about the moments that I'm capturing. Um, on a film set, you do you do get rehearsals, although nine times out of ten they're private rehearsals. So as a photographer, I'm not always allowed into a rehearsal. Um, if I can, I will peek through you know keyholes to watch a rehearsal, so I at least can be aware of what the moments are that I'm looking for when we do a take. Um, but especially with things that are, you know, fight scenes and emotional scenes, they, they're not going to do multiple takes of that if they can avoid it right. uh, for obvious reasons. 
So I really have to kind of do my prep work as much as possible to know where I want to be and what moment in that scene I really want, what I'm after in that scene, what, what the most kind of important capture is. Um, and for me, that's the moment that tells you the most story without revealing the story. Um, so there's usually one or two key moments in a, any given setup or scene that matter the most for me. Sure. Um, so that's usually what I'm looking for. That's what I'm after in terms of uh, shooting it. Um, and then what it's of, whatever comes. What kind of brand camera do you use? Can I ask? I know there aren't any comments on that. Yeah, so no, that's give okay. it out. I'm I'm a mix. I'm a mix of Canon and Fuji. Okay. Um, oh, it's been three years now, four years. So I'm pretty sure most of June part one I photographed with Fuji X-T3s. Good cameras. Um, great cameras great cameras um and here and there i brought out the canon 5d um that was usually i usually saved that for pull asides and, and sort of special portraiture um mm -hmm. mainly because i had specific lenses on it for that okay. so it was kind of like okay if we're going to do that now i'll grab that camera um or it was for like there were times when when we were out just in sandstorms and any kind of weather protective gear for the fujis just just nothing lives up for that you're literally oh. standing next to a, a like a jet fan <laughs> blowing <laughs> sand everywhere so nothing including your physical body is prepared for that um so i relied a little bit on the blimp the blimp yeah. came out not for sound protection but because it just completely enclosed the camera um so yeah so so it was a mix for me on oh. that one Let's make sure people know what a blimp is. Um, you know, having worked <laughs> on movie sets myself, and you know, for and correct me if I'm wrong in my explanation, but uh, in the past, cameras, especially the old film cameras and the DSLRs, there was a pretty big noise every time you shot a picture. Not to mention if you were shooting multiple frames um, in a row, and so they would make you blimp the camera. It was mainly called a blimp because they wrapped a lot of stuff around it. it looked like a blimp, I guess, but it, it deadened the sound and allowed you to be on set taking pictures at the same time the, uh, the, the cameras were running without disturbing and, you know, putting weird sounds in the background. Um, many photographers these days on the newer movies obviously shoot with silent shutters, which is a, a big plus Those for did not exist. <laughs> Those did not exist. I sometimes wonder how we got away with that sound because it's become so silent now that how did how did I ever take a picture without a silent camera? I, I don't I'm not sure how we managed to do that. Um, but there's also the, the, there's the reverse of it when I do um, you know editorial or when I do a pull aside with an actor and, and we're doing something away from set and uh, I'll, I'll shoot off ten frames and go oh, okay great thank you so much and they're like did you did you shoot? <laughs> I, I didn't hear anything. So, you know, it, people don't realize actually, we used to rely on that sound to a certain extent. So yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting, when you've been part of both worlds, it's an interesting shift. It is, and it's interesting now that the electronic shutters, which you know, are becoming more and more commonplace, you know, they actually put artificial sounds in them just so you feel like yeah. you're taking a picture. It's like the iPhone, yeah. for example, you know, there's a, there's no mechanics in it, but you know you, that cushing sound every yeah. time you, you shoot a yeah. picture. So it's um, comforting, yeah. it's somehow comforting. Well, there's I mean it's a reassurance that you actually triggered something, you know. So, yeah. You know, yeah. With the the Sony's I use these days, they're so silent, and you know they're shooting thirty frames a second. The only thing you have is a little square that pops up in the viewfinder, letting you know you're making exposure. It's really weird, but yeah. you, know, you know you're capturing them, and I mean it's and all this is going to advance even more in the future with you know the global shutters and things that are coming our way it's kind of a fun time to be in photography um so uh, especially with you know the kind of technology that makes your job easier so let's let's it move does. It, there's a difficulty though that the the lighting equipment is evolving at the same speed and the the vr equipment is evolving at the same speed so there are some challenges that didn't exist before like certain led lights that create oh, banding flickers and, yeah. that all of a sudden we're trying to, you know, compensate for. So that it comes with its own set of challenges. 
Now, some of that will go away in the future, not that we're, that we're going to talk technology, but, you know, there are some things such as, you know, the global shutter, which will will not have the banding because it, it's not relying on the frequencies and so forth. Um, and that's also why with many of these cameras, they allow you to set, you know, the, the frequency of the electricity you're working with to get rid of the band. But well, I, to, I did a soccer match one time and, you know, all the screens behind it, you know, the run on the rows behind and everything. It was like, oh, like, yeah. Nightmare, you know. So, anyway, these are just challenges you have to overcome. And somehow, rather, you know, <laughs> I'll take it. those over the blimp any day. Any day. <laughs> no, but that blimp is always on standby somewhere. So, always. can't let go. Right, so can't let it go. <laughs> you, you you get all these great images. You've had a day, probably shot thousands of images and so forth. Well, you go back to your hotel room and load them into what you're working with, Lightroom and everything. Or, and you have a process. Yep. What's your workflow look like? So they come straight off the card and go, um, firstly, they go to storage on a hard drive. So there's always the backup. Um, the, the first, I have to actually think this through as I do it because it becomes <laughs> so automatic. I'm like, I don't, how, what's the first? It's like trying to remember parts of your phone number without saying the whole thing. Yeah. Um, first step is they go straight into Lightroom as a whole folder. And I use Lightroom as my kind of stepping point to do an initial grade, you know, if, if I need to adjust something because I was lying on the floor and it's wonky and I need to bring it back. Um, if I need to delete the 30 images that I took with my hip of the floor, um, I do all of that as a kind of initial, and it gives me a chance to look through everything that I've shot, which means I'm, I'm taking out the stuff that's unnecessary. I'm slightly adjusting and grading the majority of it. Um, and I'm starring as I go. So if I see an image, then I'm like, oh, I need to come back to that. That's great. I just shove a star on it and then keep going. Um, and then those, once those have narrowed down, I export those back into the folder and then take them into Bridge. And in Bridge is where I do my renaming, my filing and pulling out of those starred images. And it gives me an opportunity to then narrow down those starred images whether that's, you know, giving them three stars if they're really worth looking at, but it, it takes it from some, say 50 down to 10. Mm -hmm. And when I've got those 10, then I take them into Photoshop and I do whatever real edit that I need to do, whether that's taking out wires or just, you know, really perfecting the color tones or perfecting somebody's skin, whatever it might be. Um, so that they're, I won't say magazine ready, but almost enough to serve as a guide to the studio and the labs of what we're doing on set because it all moves so quickly that I think there's a really big black hole between what's happening at the studio end and what's happening on set so I try to give them those as a guide of like here's what this is looking like so far this is where it's we're going with this this is the tone um and whether or not they use those specific images they may or may not, but at least it serves as a guide for them to kind of get an understanding of what that imagery is going to start looking like. Sure. Now, did you have to provide images every day or by the following day for review or, you know, with the dailies or anything? How did, had, what was I have kind of asked, stress? I have been asked to do that as a daily. It's impossible for me. Yeah. I, I, to do, um, especially on a location film, and I seem to have been on multiple location films recently. So, the idea that that you know you're working off out of the back of a truck possibly at a sandy location for 14 hours a day it's not realistic to be able to do that workflow on the computer at the same time so to then be doing it at the end of your day i have to i have to minimize that um otherwise it's unsustainable so I tend to do it on a weekly basis, but yes, my selects are based on what we've shot each day or per scene. Um, kind of depends on the film and how we're shooting it, but yes, they do. They get to see a daily selection of what we're doing. Well, did you get requests for something that they wanted for PR purposes or anything like that that you have to provide on a? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, you get those requests throughout. They change for every film for for what the film is um sometimes we're trying to beat a first look if it's something really high profile that they know the paparazzi are, are trying to get 
um, we want to control that the imagery that goes out for something like that is good imagery as opposed to just some long lensed paparazzi shot that doesn't do it justice. Um, so sometimes it's about trying to find a first look ahead of time. Um, sometimes it's very specific to the film, you know, like um, I've just this year shot uh, the One Love movie about Bob Marley. So the imagery that they were looking for on the pools on that movie are very specific to iconic imagery. Um, yeah, each film has its own requests that come with it. Cool. Well, it sounds like it's a lot of experience. Let's now you know switch over to the book concept, okay? Now you got all these images and it's very rare that you see books come out about you know, a movie by a photographer that did the, the, the stills for the movie. Uh, how did the evolution of this begin? And, uh, you know, you obviously, based upon our previous discussion, did a lot to make this book happen the right way. Yeah, I, 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 have, I have that mentality, I think, in most things in my life. Um, do it right or don't do it. <laughs> um, and, and especially when it comes to presenting your work, you know, I take pride in that. It, it, I do a lot of overtime and a lot of free hours because I care about what I present. I'm not one of these people who's just gonna turn over my card at the end of the day and say, yeah, there you go. See what you can get out of that. Yep. Um, I, I take pride in, you know, I'm a bit of a perfectionist. Um, <laughs> you said that with such a cute smile. <laughs> <laughs> Very, yeah. Sometimes, gotcha. <laughs> Um. But I do think with something like this, you know, it, it is such a special film. It was so beautifully made that if I'm going to put out a book of photography from it, I, it needs to live up to that. It, it just wouldn't make sense to do it in any way that didn't live up to the same level of, of care and art and respect for the for what we made. Um, so I think even throughout the filming, while I was working on those selects, you know, bit by bit, my selects folder was growing and, and I would have the filmmakers or crew come and sit next to me while I was doing these selects and they would just scan through them and everybody took such an interest in them. Um, our DP, Greg, was was really encouraging and, and a, a huge advocate for them. So I think I already kind of, while we were in production, had this idea in my head that these could be more than just marketing material. Um, so as we got kind of near the end and I was turning over the, the final hard drives, um, I was pretty vocal with our filmmakers, with Tanya, the producer, um, about feeling like there could be an exhibit in here, there could be a book in here, um, because there were so many images that wouldn't get used just because they didn't fit the box of the campaign you know um so it started as just sort of hints and thoughts and opinions and um after the movie been so successful um tanya had put out a really beautiful making of book the art and soul of june um which had been hugely successful because it is absolutely brilliant. And there was an interest, there was an interest in doing more books. So Tanya, having had those chats with me along the way, she brought that up to me and she said, you know, there is, there is interest in books. And I said, hmm, can I, can I go ahead and pitch one yeah, please? <laughs> um, to which she, to which she put me in touch with them. And, and so the initial kind of meeting was really me just pitching what I had in mind um which started very much as this kind of tash and fade and style art photography book um because i so desperately wanted to present it in the artistic way that it deserved that this film really was <clears throat> was more than just a movie it was cinema it was art and i wanted to do that justice yeah. so i you know i pitched this kind of cloth bound big <laughs> one image per page um book that maybe wasn't so realistic for a first pitch. Um, but the the response at the time was, well, but you know, the world's already seen these photographs. I thought, no, 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 no. There's, I took 30,000 images on that movie. 
the world has seen a handful. Um, so they asked me to send over what, you know, just a selection of what I was suggesting. And I sent them 50 images they hadn't seen before. And they very quickly came back and said, if there's more where this came from, then yes, let's do this. <laughs> so it was, it was great. It was really, it was a really positive response. Um, and then it just became about laying it out and, and trying to find the right way to lay out this, this kind of middle ground book of something that could have a bigger market than, than a big art book, which can be very expensive and, and really sort of a smaller audience. Um, there was, you know, trying to find a way of keeping the art about it and keeping that, that style, but making it more accessible. Um, and I think we did an okay job. I think that. you did better than an okay job. I mean, okay, uh, good. <laughs> you know, like I said, if I, I, you, if I, if I was scoring it, it was a two glasser, which was pretty high to, to get when you sit down <laughs> with a glass of wine and yeah, I got to get another glass because I'm still going, you know, so. <laughs> Um, I think the publishers were, were yeah, there, there was a bit of a, not a fight, but like, I think they were getting irritated with me because I just, there was so much imagery and trying to narrow it down. I think we got down to 500 images that were kind of like, okay, I can let go of everything else. But these, these 500, by the way, out of 30 some thousand, yeah, 500 sounds like a lot, but it's really not in comparison. And it was like, okay, we've got these 500. And then they were saying, well, no, we have to get this to like 250. <laughs> so it's hard. That became how do we do that? How do we do that? And and trying to pick those images was sometimes really stressful. You know, the, there are a handful that didn't make it that I'm just gonna have to keep for myself because yeah. they never made it. But but I tried to kind of encompass as much as possible from the experience, from behind the scenes, from each character. I really tried to kind of give it a fair. But it's, but it's it's a mix of a lot of things. I one of the shots I like is you know this particular one with you know the microphones um, above the subjects and then of course on the facing page you've got you know this group of people uh, and everything and and it really is just hard and I know it's emotional for uh, you as a photographer. I mean heck you know I have a it, it I think any photographer that doesn't have emotion with you know the images that he presents you know even if he just wanted to do a folio and you know you have thousands of images and your folio can contain 30 wow how do you get down to that That's point so and well so you know hard. The, it's hard for us as photographers but i think what happens is the viewer doesn't see that they just they don't know the story of what was left out so they're at least only yeah, experiencing and you know hopefully you're, you're 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 hitting the heart and the emotion and all the things that are important to us as photographers with the images that you presented and you 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 scored right on i think it's just uh, great mixtures of scenes you see on the movie but scenes that you know it looks like it it, it took to, to make the movie and do the sets and you know do all the things I, you know you've got one page set here which you know not only shows some of the the the, the pictures that were involved in getting there and and the actual people behind the scenes but what the, the shot looked like you know, that was part of it. So it's it's really well done. You also did a good job, I believe, with uh, the Ford. Now, Tanya, um, who you've mentioned, um, you know, she gave a Ford to it, which was excellent. And uh, the, the preface and the, the afterwards were, were really, really good. And um, I think my only complaint about the book is I had to go all the way to back because I was so curious about what each image was to get to the caption side of things. So... <laughs> Um, <laughs> that's an interesting thing you bring up because I, I fought to take the captions off the pages which is cool because you're only relying on the image exactly and and that was important to me I really wanted it to be about the photographs and not the font and not the text um so that one I had to push really hard so it ended up all at the back so sorry you had to do a little work but I no, it, no, it, was, it, it was a, it was worth the work because, because actually I I just basically started giving up on you know, referencing them because it's important. You know, it's like, okay, I, I know I saw this and then you go back and get the caption. But the caption is part is a reasonable thing. So once you get through the book, you go to the the, the caption side of things and um, you, you you go through and you, you reference it all out. So it's it works. And what I like about that, and I think that's something that some people always argue on and it's a flip of a coin for some and others, it's uh, a pretty important part of it is you know, relying on the imagery to, to carry the story. But, you know, you, you can reference the, the captions 
and um, you know learn a little bit more about where that was done and um, you know a little bit more of a description to it. So uh, either way, you, you know you can be satisfied with it and and it works. So um, well, number one, I want to say you made a great choice uh, to see a book that you know didn't have to have the captions underneath it to carry the image, uh, but for those that are curious can reference the captions uh, so you understand what you're looking at or who exactly. who's in the picture and everything was well done. So, you know, my hat's off to you on that one. Very cool. So let's, let's talk about something else, you know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you had a, an interesting experience on this and, you know, we always talk a little bit about, you know, life and love and passion and so forth. Uh, your life changed on that movie set, didn't it? In so many ways. <laughs> <laughs> so, so many ways so you want to share a little bit about that uh i i assume you're referring to jake um yeah. <laughs> yep so uh you're in love yeah it's so it's so <laughs> funny because i i was so conscious at the time of being focused on the job and not being distracted from it and also being you know there's an element of being a woman in this role that has nuances to it that I, I don't know that most men in my role would understand. Um, it's, I was really focused on, on maintaining a certain level of professionalism. Very good. So falling in love at the same time doesn't help. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I, we had, we kept it so quiet at the beginning because we were coming to the end of the film and I, d I just wanted to maintain that professionalism. So it's funny now actually talking about it. Um, yeah, I, I was, it was such an experience of, of love and respect and collaboration on that set in general that for a long time, I wasn't even sure if it was just that environment. You know, I fell in love with several people in this film one who has become my life partner, others who've become life friends. Um, and I've carried, I've carried a lot of these people with me now, but it, you do wonder when you're in that experience, if it's just the romance of an experience Wrong. like that, that is so wonderful that you're in this, this kind of detached world. We were on location for 90% of it. Um, it's not real life even mm. though it is, you know, when, when that's your job and you're a freelancer, um, but then you come home and you come home to build and you come home to real life. And you do wonder, will this be the same when it's not in that environment? Um, and it turns out it, it was real because four <laughs> years later, we are still together. Um, but yes, I, I did. I fell in love on that film. Well, yes. Yeah, that's a story you can carry with you for a long time. And it, it <laughs> almost just makes the whole experience of, you know, what what you did, you know, even that more special. It's always when you're not Absolutely. looking for it, you find you know, When you're not looking for it, you find it. Let's make it uh, so people understand. Jake was- uh, Oh, know, sorry, yeah, actually. <laughs> yeah, he was a DP and you worked Explain next that. to him a lot. He's, he's the, um, he was the first assistant camera also sometimes referred to as the focus puller. Um, and he, yeah, his position puts him right next to camera and yes. which is often a position that I want to be in. <laughs> so just by the nature of our jobs, we spend a lot of time around each other um, and getting to know each other. And I think maybe about halfway through the film realized that maybe there was more than just professionalism going on. Um, mm -hmm. I have to say though, his whole department were really special. You know, some of those images in the book, like the one you just held up um, with the two microphones on the oh. on the opposite page, there's um, Timothy Paul Atreides in amongst all the Atreides clan walking. An image like that, I couldn't possibly get without the team around me giving me access. And our grip, our key grip, Guy Micheletti, he gave me a seat on his dolly while he's oh. tracking. Without that seat, without that access, that image would just never exist. I would never be able to get in there and move with them at that speed 
to capture something like that. So not just Jake, but the whole camera department, the grip department, the electrical department, hair, makeup, costume, everybody was so giving and collaborative on this film that the images really speak to that. And, and that was a big part of what I wanted to express was my love for this crew, not just Jake, but the whole crew in terms of that collaboration and that give, they're all a part of this book in the sense that I wouldn't have had such imagery without them. So it, there's a real team effort that goes into, into the photographs that are in that book. Obviously the team worked closely together. Did that start with the director who was you know, an incredible director in the first place, but you know, does everything kind of wander so. down or is it just firm, you know, I mean, you just make your own so. place? You know, I've always, I've always said and believed that shit rolls downhill yeah, yeah. in my language, <laughs> but it starts at the top. And I, I do, I think Denis has made a, an art of surrounding himself with the right people. Um, he has found a group of artists who are also incredibly good people. So you have people like Patrice Vermette, you have people like Paul Lambert, you have Greg Frazier, you have these guys who are the top of their game. I mean, they are absolute artists, masters at what they do, but they also care about the collaboration and they care about the people involved and they're, they're just good humans. So <laughs> that combination, when you have multiple people of that same mindset together, it does really create an atmosphere of that rolls downhill then everybody steps up to be the same and wants to participate in the same way and you want to do a good job and you want to push the boundaries that much further to really come through for them sure. you know you want to give back and the productivity <clears throat> that comes from that is really quite special um and it's rare that you have so many in one place so i think yeah i think denis is the kind of the ringleader of that um he's he's chosen his people wisely yeah you hear so many times of conflicts on the set or it's um you know um what, what do they call those things when it's not a, a safe environment to work in it's you know a lot of tension and yelling and screaming and whatnot but um you you can tell it just it just worked what an experience you've had holy cow you know pretty special one pretty special one well, um, as we close out here, I want everybody to, you know, look at this book, consider it, uh, get it. Uh, I've enjoyed it. It's going on top of our coffee table, uh, probably because my wife wants a, a glass of wine to look at it. I can get it to you. She, <laughs> me, she'll too, probably, me too. <laughs> she'll probably do a, a, a three glasser on this one. But anyway, <laughs> and you know, we made a point saying, God, we, we did watch Dune a few years ago, but it's like we got to get that out mainly because number one we know the photographer that shot the, the the stills that the movie's a good movie and it'd be nice to see it before doom 2 comes out which i guess is Absolutely. happening sometime this fall so i'm looking forward to that you didn't work on the doom 2 movie but um it i'm sure it's going to be a, a wonderful movie but just to have a, a set book like what you've produced is uh, an incredible um, collection of images that really gives you a glimpse specifically if you're a photographer of behind the scenes I mean I I know this book can hit the general audience pretty well but as photographers you know we're so used to looking at landscape books and you know other kind of you know books in the in that genre but the to see a book that is you know photographing uh, a, a movie and and kind of takes you into the depths of you know what it's like to be there you know, what it's like to, to see it being made and to also see some of the shots that you're familiar with from the movie if you've seen it. So um, it's a, I was surprised. I wasn't sure when I got the call uh, what to expect. And when the book arrived, I was just uh, blown away by it. So um, thank you for all your efforts to make this book and not to mention all the time you've now spent with me. <laughs> no, no problem. It's a, it's a pleasure. And as I said, like, it's really exciting to get to see these images have a life. So. That's the best part for me. Well I, well, I look forward to some of your future projects. And um, now that we know each other and, you know, you'll know how to find me, obviously. Um, <laughs> you know, I, you know, let, well, I hope I get a chance to do something like this on, you know, whatever project you you, know, you decide to next. Um, you're a marvelous I photographer. So it sound, sounds like you. your dad. 
that your dad must have been a heck of a fun guy to work for or told him everything he knows <laughs> <laughs> well so but anyway i mean you know who who who, who gets to apprentice by being the, the daughter of a well-known um uh, photographer like that so uh, that had to be a great experience. He, he he taught you well, and you you've got the craft down to the point of really being simple. And as photographers, one of the things that I think stuck with me from this talk that we had today is that you know we're gearheads. I'm not I, I used to be a super gearhead. Um, as I've gotten older, I've I've you know cleaned the shelves off, so to speak. And now you know <laughs> as I'm getting older, and it's harder to carry a fifty pound backpack. You know, I'm I'm leaning more towards the setup. Yeah. Like, give me give me two cameras. You know, look like back in the old days when I used to have you know two cameras and pick one up and shoot real quick, and cover the vocal lengths uh, as it is. Just keep it simple and and focus on focus on what's in front of you. And yeah. you know, you seem to have gotten that figured out pretty well because I'm sure you know a lot of photographers would have a case of lenses and three cameras or a backpack full of lenses and you know be trying to change them and do things all the time and. It just goes to show, I think, with your approach, the kind of photography you can get when you're not burdened by the gear that you're using. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. I, there's something happening in our world at the moment where the speed on set has just multiplied. And, you know, they're shooting multiple units at one time, different locations, and you're trying to be in all places at once. And... I've just had to narrow it down to a backpack that I can get to as many places on my own without any help, without any vehicle, without, you know, any assistance to be able to do that and, and be able to shoot as much as possible in all of that at one time. The only way I can do that is to, to simplify. So, so you're absolutely right. It's, it's a matter of, um, it's a matter of necessity that's led to a style. Well, you know, it, it, it works and you, you've accomplished it very well. Chiabella, I mean, I could probably spend hours talking to you and, uh, <laughs> you know, I wish we could find a way to grab a cup of coffee and tell more stories and see more work. And Well, next uh, time you're in London, let me know. <laughs> and next time you're in Indianapolis, like you're going to come to Indianapolis. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. You never, you never know. know. <laughs> but um, you know, it'd be, it also would be fun somewhere along the line to, to see as you mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, um, an exhibit of your work. So hopefully somewhere oh. in, you know, that, that'll happen because uh, your, your work would stand out incredibly well at a gallery or exhibit or something. But I want to thank you so much for the time. Um, it was a marvelous, marvelous chat, great book. And um, don't become a stranger, okay? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Everybody, Kevin Raver, Photo PXL. Chiabella, thanks very much, and uh, we'll catch you on the next video.